there is just something wonderful that happens when students in some sense look into the mirror of something of their own experience in reading him. Merton's gift, wouldn't you say, for intimacy of expression, for having his reader identify with him and therefore identify with his, his quest, his needs, you know, his confusion. I mean, there's everything there for a reader, I'm referring, referring to the Seven Story Mountain, to identify with him. Well, it just astonishes me that this is just perennial. It's generation after generation. I've been teaching at Iona College, which is where I teach, for the last 35 or more years. And they haven't named a building after me yet. But um, the amazing thing to me is that I can go back, I keep all of my, my roll books, and I can go back to every single class I ever taught and I can pick out the two or three students who got the gift, whatever that gift is that Merton gives. Uh, I mean, he gives it in a general sense to, to everybody who reads him, but then there are a few that really get awake and they get allured into this field of grace, the, the hidden ground of love as he would call it. I think Merton still has a great deal to say to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a feeling, and this is kind of a cliche when you think about it, but those of us who are aging, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm about to enter my holy 70s, mm -hmm. and there's a whole cohort, as you know, of people behind me, mm -hmm. right behind right me, behind you who there. are baby boomers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have a feeling that it's going to be difficult for us coming out of the culture of activity and uh, sensations mm -hmm. and media that we've been schooled in, I think it's going to be difficult for us to experience our lives in solitude. I think it's going to be difficult for us when we are no longer wanted but are on the shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Merton has a great deal to teach when he talks about solitude and he talks about loneliness and prayer. Um, I've been thinking about doing a paper <laughs> called mm -hmm. Merton's Tears. Oh, how gorgeous. You know, Penthos and yes. Conversion, in Thomas Merton's yes, journals. Gorgeous. The idea of Merton always, you know, talking about his weaknesses and how in the very uh, establishment of himself in weakness, he says, the Holy Spirit is invited to come down mm -hmm. upon my weakness. Right. And I think that those of us who are aging are going to have to appreciate mm -hmm. and be creative in our constrictions, in our limitations. And Merton is a mentor for that because let's face it, he was a monk doing the same schedule for 26 years. Mm -hmm. And within the limitations of that stability, look at what he was able to accomplish intellectually, mm -hmm. emotionally. Right. Um, so, so this constriction we're all facing eventually uh, is, is a moment of possible creativity. Sometime it'll, for many of us, it might be a moment of suffering and tears. Mm -hmm. And the creative way we handle that uh, will be all there is we can do. But I think Merton is, is going to be more important, not less, as the years go on, mm -hmm. for people my age, as well as hopefully for young people. I feel that he has given me not just the courage, but in a sense the mandate to stand in the public places and to, to be in this world a witness for life, a witness for truth. Um, in a courageous way. You can't read Merton's journals and worship, put incense. Mm -hmm. uh, Merton said, I think most beautifully, I'm nobody's answer, not even my own. Mm -hmm. So Merton didn't want a guru status. But seeing him struggle, I see my own struggles. He, he consoles me in my own struggles, just the human struggles of being alive and what we all face together. And then he's been a window for me. And by that I mean a good teacher. 
I've, I've read Merton and then wanted to read what he's read, mm -hmm. what he was interested in. Uh, these are the kinds of things that have always attracted me about him, and I still find him mentoring me. And I never was interested in Merton, in, in meeting Merton personally. Uh, I had a friend who did. I said, how was it? He said, no bells, lights, or whistles. <laughs> uh, but he, but I, I never wanted to meet him personally. It was Merton's text. Merton, to me, in two ways, is a living text. Mm -hmm. His text is still alive for me. I take up a dialogue with him. Mm -hmm. And his very, his very life is a living text. And that's, you know, people refer to monks in the desert as living text. They didn't say much like Francis of Assisi, mm -hmm. but you could tell by their lives their message. And I think Merton was fortunate as a writer uh, to, to, to be in a, in a place where what he wrote about, he was actually living. There is this wonderful field that I feel that Merton is. He's almost like an energetic field in this, in this world. And and he lives in it, and he abides in it, and he seems to draw others into it. And that's where we all meet each other somehow. 